concept of Sunnah in the Muwatta of Malik ibn Anas, Muhammad Yusuf Quraya, 1969. Malik sets aside this decision of Umar by saying, the practice is not based upon it. Abdullah ibn Umar reports that Umar was washed, shrouded and prayed over at his funeral. After reporting this hadith, Malik remarks, It has reached me from the learned Ahlul Ilm that the martyrs were not washed, nor were they prayed uh, no, nor was any prayer said over them. They were buried in their clothes in which they were killed. Not only does Malik dispose of hadiths from the companions on the basis of practice, he also subordinates them by means of his own considered opinion combined with practice. Malik, from Nafi to the slave of uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, who was a fugitive, was accused of theft, and Abdullah ibn Umar sent him to Sa- Sa'ad. Sa'id ibn al-Asi, the governor of Medina, for the cutting off of his hand. Sa'id refused to cut off his hand and said, We do not cut off the hand of a fugitive slave when he is accused of theft. Abdullah ibn Umar asked Sa'id, In which verse of the Qur'an do you find this injunction? Then Abdullah ibn Umar ordered the cutting off of his hand, and it was cut off. Against this decision of Abdullah ibn Umar, Malik quotes the opinion of Qasim ibn Muhammad, Salim ibn Abdullah, and Ura ibn Zubair, that they used to say, When a fugitive slave is accused of theft, the punishment of cutting off of the hand will not be inflicted. Malik endorses this opinion by saying, the matter about which there is no disagreement amongst us is that when a fugitive slave is accused of theft, his hand will not be cut off. Malik to Hisham to Urwa to Urwa to Aisha used to say, nonsensical oaths, la wal yameen is the saying of a person, la wallah, la wallah, no by God, no by God. Against this interpretation of Aisha, Malik said, the best I heard in this connection is that the nonsensical oath is the swearing of a person concerning something about which he is confident that is in accordance with what he thinks. Then he discovers later on that it is not like that. That is the nonsensical oath. Number four. We have seen we have seen Malik's treatment of hadith from the Prophet and also his attitudes towards hadith from the companions. Hadith from the successors are also very important for Malik, and we do not find them to have less legal force in the Muatta than hadith from the higher authorities i.e. hadiths from the Prophet and from the companions. Malik's treatment of these hadiths is no different from his treatment of hadiths from higher authorities, so far as their agreement or disagreement with Malik's doctrine is concerned. We see many examples in the Muatta where such hadiths are discarded when there is a clash between the practice or doctrine of Malik and hadiths. Malik to Abd Razak bin Hakim related that he had caught a fugitive slave who had committed theft. Razak said that he was in doubt about what to do, so he wrote about it to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, asking him about the punishment in such a case. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was governor in those days. Razik wrote to him, informing him, I have heard that when a fugitive slave is convicted of theft, his hand should be cut off. He said, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz wrote to him, refuting his, refuting his letter. You wrote to me that you heard a fugitive slave, when he commits a theft, will not have his hand cut off. And by God Almighty, God Almighty says in his book, the hands of both the male thief and the female thief should be cut off. If the theft amounts to one-fourth of a dinar, his hand must be cut. Malik does not approve this hadith and relates the opinion of those who disagree with the doctrine. Malik said, Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad and Salim ibn Abdullah and Urwa ibn Zubair used to say that when a fugitive slave commits a theft, the punishment of amputation of hands is not obligatory. Malik endorses this view. That is the matter about which there is disagreement amongst us. Malik to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz commands, commanded Muhammad ibn Muslim to order the reciters of the Quran to prostrate themselves during the chapter against this general command of the Caliph throughout the Khilafah. Malik said, The practice with us is that there is the Quran, only 11 prostrations, and there is no prostration in the Mufassal chapters. This statement of Malik does not include where prostration was held to be necessary by Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So much so that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz took much pains to promulgate prostration in this chapter by decree throughout the Caliphate. Ibn Musayyib, Ibn Shihab and Rabia, three major authorities of Malik, declared that a person can perform Hajj on behalf of others. Malik does not approve the unanimous decision of the three great authorities of Medina and says the practice was not according to their view. The conclusion of what has been said so far is that the hadiths from the Prophet and from some sequent authorities are all legal arguments with Malik. They are all equal in legal force and one does not have preference over another. They supersede one over another indiscriminately. In this process of supersession, supersession, there is no distinction among hadiths from the Prophet, from the companions and from the successors. During our study of the hadiths and the Muatta, we have realized that in the process of supersession, Amal, the practice and the considered opinion that Rai of Malik himself hold a prominent place. 
It is evident from our study of Malik's use of hadith that the Amal and Rai were always above other arguments. These two principles often superseded the others, but they were never superseded by them. Thus, we conclude that so far as the legal arguments for the Mota are concerned, Amal and Rai are the high, highest arguments. Further, it emerges from the evidence that the hadith from the Prophet or from any subsequent authority for Malik are not the final criterion to judge the right Islamic point of view on a certain legal issue. Rather, they seem to provide evidence to support a view accepted on grounds other than that of the hadith themselves. It shows that the hadiths do not occupy the same positions in the motto as they occupy in the orthodox view. They are rather one of the arguments, much like other legal arguments in the motto. Therefore, they cannot be the most authoritative base of the sunnah in the motto. This means that the concept of sunnah in the motto is essentially different from the concept of sunnah, essentially based on the hadiths, where the hadiths possess an overriding authority and constitutes the final and decisive argument. End of, tab end of chapter 2. Stay tuned for chapter 3 and many more parts.